someone told me last year there were 6,000 people in Colorado who did hemp and 50% of them went bankrupt in the first year. And they said one of the reasons was because they weren't farmers. And it's, this is so different, so different than row cropping, so different than corn and soybeans. I mean, just dramatically different. So it's like going to play the high, the high stakes table at Vegas and you don't understand the rules of the game. <laughs> you never played before. So of course your probability of winning is gonna be low. So that's what hemp is all about. I mean, you're going to the high stakes table at Vegas and if you don't understand the game, then I think your, your probabilities of winning is slim to none. Hemp has been grown in, in the United States, in most of the United States, for 100 years. So in the state of South Carolina, last year only they had 20 people who were growing it. And of those 20 people, they can only do 20 acres. So this year, they have, I think, about 100 plus people. And we're doing um, probably 75 acres. So we're doing 4x than anybody last year. So the point I'm making there is trial and error for everybody. <laughs> so, um, so it's not something that the team is doing wrong or we're trialing and error. It's not like growing corn and soybeans, it's, it's new. We use the water all the fields at least three times a day each field three times a day. And this is the fridge watering for field number one. We also have the workers out there checking to make sure we don't have any leaks, uh, make sure that the drip is clear so the water's going through all the plants. So are you, was it dirty, clean? <laughs> good, lots of pressure. Yeah, yeah, that's good. We just keep doing it. We put the water to it and hopefully we get some rain and we don't have to do all this. I was telling my brother, I said, I'm working three times harder than I do at my regular job. So yes, yeah, a lot of work uh, and a lot of hours. Where you grew up? Yes, it is. So um, I grew up here um, 50 years ago. Um, the first part of this right here was a store, and he had a grocery store. So he was also the community um, grocery store. So people would um, come here from all around to buy the grocery, and he also had gasoline and diesel fuel as well too. So people would work in the field, and he would pay them, you know, three dollars a bushel for for uh, peas. And then they would come here and he would get his $3 back in terms of, you know, selling them lunch or whatever, um, the groceries that they need for the, for the family. So where's the community grocery now? That's one of the problems right now. There's no grocery store in the whole area. If you look around here, you will not see a grocery store around. And that's, this area will be classified as a food desert. A food desert is basically any community where within a three or four mile range or five mile range, there's no grocery store where they can buy fresh produce. And there's no farmer's market around here. So his vision would have sort of um, cut down all of the problems associated with food insecurity and food desert. Prior to this year, to get a permit was a pen in the, in the neck. There were so many hoops you have to jump through. But now a lot of those restrictions have been lifted. And I think the state is also recognizing the importance of industrial hemp as an agricultural crop. It's going to be one of the biggest economic booms in, agri in the agricultural sector in the next few years. And that's why they're encouraging a lot of farmers and lifting the restrictions. So many farmers are already lost in this area that have no crop. Farmers have lost because of drought. I mean, I know someone who's lost probably 40 acres just because they didn't have water. They thought they could get through and wait for the rain. I know other farmers who didn't get any flowers because the males pollinated the females. You know, I know other farmers who um, didn't have the right plants from the beginning. They didn't germinate. So there's a lot of things that could go wrong that have gone wrong to other farmers. I would tell you there's probably 
eight out of 10 farmers that have started down this journey are probably out. I mean, we're probably still, if not the largest or second largest grower in the state of South Carolina. But we still got, we still got ways to go and next year is gonna be even better. Yeah. The worms are doing some pretty serious damage and they're, they're eating the leaves and they're, they're affecting the buds, the flowers. So I think we hit the worms hard because we have another, I think, week, two weeks at least before peak beginning harvest. So if we can knock the worms back and pump the roots and the foliar with everything that the plants need right now to fill out those flowers, the buds, then I think we'll be golden. The this guy, yeah. but again, but this guy. But you can see this browning, this kind of, this is the worms. They, they just kind of, whatever they're doing with their slime, they're eating the leaves and then they're sliming the buds. And when they slime the buds, they turn brown on the surface and you get a lot of damaged, a lot of damaged buds, damaged flowers. You know, I, I turn to some of the best universities in the state of South Carolina and say, okay, I got this problem with, with ants, what is it? They don't know. I mean, they're like, ants, are you serious? No, ants can't be the issue. They didn't think it was until one day my brother filmed it and then he showed the video and ants were crawling all up and down the plant. But when you go out there and look at the field, sometimes they're hiding. They're, they built their nests underneath. So I think that's the point that you're, you're right. You're, the rules are being defined as you go along. This is South Carolina in the peak of summer, right? It's like overwhelming with like, and you imagine that those bugs are just gonna ravage the crop. But there's like this, I can feel this like balance happening. You've got forest. You know, the weeds, you've got grasses, you've got this ecology happening here. Um, and we're not spraying chemicals, you know, we're doing this organic. And so I think there's this really interesting allowing nature to kind of play itself out a little bit, not trying to over control the situation. And that's the thing that's interesting about these plants. When you feed it the right nutrients and the right water, they, they move overnight. Yeah. But also what's interesting about the plant, if it doesn't have the right thing, it'll just sit out there and wait for you. So something these plants are telling us in this field, look, I've done all this flowering for you, but something, tell me you love, tell me. Me, you love me or tell me you need to, I need to take these worms off of me. They're, these insects keep biting me and they're gnawing at me. And if you can just get rid of those, I'm gonna perform for you again. Cause that's something is, is happening here. If you don't have the technology, the analytics, the knowledge, don't do this. <laughs> Don't do it. It's not. Uh, <laughs> you might have a better chance putting your money in the stock market. <laughs>you know, I'm just proud of the team and the people and what they've done and all the support that we've gotten from so many companies. The people, Eden Solutions, who does all the nutrients to Farmer D, to NetFM, to WP Law, AAA Well, you know, John Deere. I mean, you just name it. There's just been a host of people who've been there from the beginning. And um, I'm proud of what they've done, what we've done. <laughs>